This podcast includes explicit content. Listener discretion is advised. Hello and welcome to this episode of Erste's Podcast Meets. On this occasion, we're going to talk to Sophie Hagen. She's an award-winning stand-up comedian, author of the book Happy Fat, podcaster behind the podcast of Made of Human, Secret Dinosaur Call, and Comedian Stelling Stuff, a fat activist and a blogger. The Erste's Podcast. Sophie, is there anything I'm missing here? I think you got most of them, yeah. <laughs> Tell us about Happy Fat. It's your upcoming book, right? Yes. It's my first book about essentially why it's okay to be fat. So it talks about my lived experience with fatness. It talks about, I have advice, like if you want to love your body, this is what I would recommend you to do. Things that you can actually do in your life that doesn't require you to suddenly just start thinking you're amazing. I find it so interesting and the way in which you, like, you start speaking about this, about this, like, love yourself, love yourself, love yourself. Like, it's, okay, where's the switch where I just, like, overnight love myself? Yeah, yeah, it's so hard. It's so difficult. And also, it's unrealistic. You know, you can't. No one can just be positive all the time. I met a, a very prominent fat activist and I asked her, I was like, so how did you learn to love your body? And she was like, what? Oh, <laughs> I don't love my body. I also don't hate my body. I just have a body. And I kind of started thinking about, I don't have any feelings about my ears, right? I don't love my ears. I don't hate my ears. I just have ears and I know that I can hear with them. And that's great. It's weird, you know, having to put this emotion onto a thing that's practical. You know, like my elbows, I have no feelings about my elbows. No feelings at all. They're just elbows. I don't love them. I don't hate them. It's just neutral. So I think body neutrality is probably the way to go. I mean, only a psychopath would like every day be like, oh my God, I'm amazing. I'm amazing. I love my body. My body is the best body in the whole world. Like sometimes your body is like sick and sometimes your body hurts and sometimes you don't really feel dissociated from your body or, you know, it's not a solution. So there's a lot of the book is about that. A lot of the book is also about the fact that this isn't our problem. You know, like there are perpetrators, you know, there are actual people and corporations who decide to create a society where everyone, especially women, just hate themselves and will spend so much money on trying to become thin. And then somehow the solution to that is that we then have to fix each other and ourselves instead of attacking the people who did this to us. So a lot of it is also, you know what, it doesn't matter if you love your body or not. That's not the point. The point is we need to attack them and make sure this doesn't happen because most people reading this will be, I assume, over the age of 16, 20, 30, 40. And as people are reading it, as I was writing it, there were children who are being indoctrinated into thinking that they're too fat and they should be thin. And by then it's already too late. We've already ruined lives. So it's also about putting the focus on the actual problem, which is, you know, capitalism and the patriarchy and this entire system of like white supremacy and uh, homophobia and transphobia, this whole system that just kills people. So it's not about oh how to love your body, how to embrace your curves. It's about let's end this. Like, let's make sure that this doesn't happen anymore. So we finally have a sponsor, and this is none other than Erstis. That's right, the Erstis podcast sponsored by Erstis. Who would have thought it? This means if you want to see what our day job looks like, then head to erstis-podcast.com slash Erstis. That's E-R-S-T-I-E-S. Check out the video and follow the link and you'll receive 50% off your first month. Please note that the content is 18 plus. This is the first time I'm speaking real life to a comedian. So I have many questions and many things that I don't know. So I will start with a very basic one. What is it like to be a comedian? Oh God, I love it. I really love it. Like it's my favorite thing in the whole world. I saw comedy for the first time when I was 10 years old. It felt like magic because it was just a man standing on stage talking. Nothing else, like no instruments, no visual effects. It was just someone talking. And then I was laughing, like my stomach, like I was like cramping with laughter, just like crying. So for me, comedy has always been this magical thing where somehow using certain words and word combinations and little like verbal tricks, you can make like a lot of people just laugh. Oh, I mean, I know I'm just describing what it is, but <laughs> I've always thought it's the best thing in the world. So I 
absolutely love it. And I love that there's no end to it. Like you can always get funnier. You can always get better. You can always become a better performer. So I never reach a point where I'm like, oh yeah, that's it then. I'm done now. I can always improve. And I love that. It kind of like took me to the question that I had afterwards, because For an interview thing beyond the joke, you mentioned that, that you were never like satisfied about your performance in stage, that and the point of like stand-up, it's that it's never a goal and it's pretty much a journey. So what does your journey look like at the moment? At the moment, I'm currently working on my fourth show and my first show was very, it was a very good show. It was very funny and it also had a bit of seriousness. And then after that, I think I um, I got really involved with the serious bit. I was really into the whole drama and the trying to make the audience cry and, you know, talking about, you know, traumatic stuff and then trying to make that funny. And also I started therapy again. So my mind was just full of all this like sad stuff and trauma. So I had two shows, my two middle shows. When I watch them now, they are funny. But when I did them in my head, I was just thinking about all this like, darkness and sadness and trauma. So my new show where I'm at in my journey is I want to go back to funny. I want to go back to just like, ah, oh, funny, but then with a dash of seriousness. But I want to just feel like I'm funny again and not have to, you know, open my soul on stage to, you know, and then go backstage afterwards and feel like, oh God, I just opened my trauma to all these people. So in my journey, I think I've gone full circle now. I've tried to be funny. I tried to be really serious. And now I'm back to trying to find like a healthy balance between talking about my life and trauma and serious stuff and identity, but also being a comedian, because that is primarily what I am. <laughs> but I guess like comedy is always like that serious. In a way, yeah. Uh, at least in my in my opinion, like the best kind of comedy is the one that somehow like always speak about. It's a way of like speaking about your truth, about coping with things. Absolutely, I agree, and I love that sort of comedy myself. It's my favorite shows. I like that. My previous show, Dead Baby Frog. I opened the whole show by saying, "Hey, trigger warning." This whole show is about emotional abuse. And then like my first sentence was like, my grandfather was horrifically abusive. And you're like, it's kind of hard to go from there and then be like, ha ha ha, <laughs> jokey joke joke. So I think if I if I had to do that show again now, I would I would find another way in and I would maybe talk about, you know, a nice thing, but then occasionally also mention the grandfather thing and the abuse thing and then make it less. I put uh, leaflets on all of the chairs that said, you know, this show is about emotional abuse and here's some helplines you can call if you're triggered and, you know, this you can always leave if you want. And all of that just puts this into people's heads. So they're watching it going, oh my God, what's what's going to happen? This is going to be so uncomfortable, you know. And I think I, when I delivered it, I was like, oh yeah, he was a really bad man. And oh, it was actually really painful, you know. So I think the the good shows that talk about trauma are really good at going, hey, everything's fine. Let's make jokes about this. Well, mine wasn't completely there yet. I don't think I've really dealt with it yet. <laughs> this is comedy, but now it's horror. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I find it fascinating because it's way deeper than just like cracking like senseless jokes or so. And at the same time, I wonder what things can change through comedy. You mean in general? I think, yeah, like first, in certain, I think that it can be like both like somehow like a personal way, coping with things like dealing with trauma and so on. But also, I guess that in general, because in your work, you are always making space for somehow marginalized identities. So I guess it can be like both dimensions to that question. Yeah, I, I think that oh, it's going to sound so wanky. But <laughs> I think laughter, it's so freeing. Like laughter in itself is so, you know, like it sends endorphins out. You know, you feel calmer, you feel happier, you feel better just in general. You're kind of allowing your body for a moment to just let go of some of all of the tension and the anxiety. And then I did this interview in Denmark recently. And this interviewer said something like, why do you want to be a feminist when all feminists do are like killjoys? And she kind of insinuated that feminism is, is this group of people and we're all sitting there and we're all like just really angry and uh, don't say anything about that and we're all just really mad at everything and uh. and I was like 
oh, but we are so funny. <laughs> like, if you've ever been in a group full of marginalized people who are feminists and, you know, activists and social justice warriors or whatever, we laugh so much. But the things we can laugh at, we couldn't laugh at with a bunch of, you know, white, straight, cis men, because then they would get all sensitive about it. But when we're all just us, we can be like, oh, fuck men. And then people can be like, oh, yeah, fuck men. And we can all just laugh at these situations. You know, like when I talk to fellow fat people, I can, you know, my friends talked about how she'd had a kebab thrown at her. And we just kind of laughed a bit because we were like, yeah, oh, yeah, me too. And then we laughed about, oh, I wish it was a less funny food. You know, like having an apple thrown at you is not as funny as a kebab. Kebab is funny. But to most people, that's not funny at all. But there's something about, so what I do with what I hope that I do with my comedy is, and it's kind of, I had a line in my book as well, which is about fatness, where I talk about how if you're a thin person or if you're a thin white man, or if you've just in no way been marginalized ever, this won't feel like it's for you. But it is still for you because we all grew up watching or consuming art made by white, straight, thin men. And I bet if you ask them, they would say, oh yeah, it's for everyone even though they never actively tried to include us in it. So I think that's what I want to do with my comedy is to go, this is for my people. And if you're not one of my people, fine, you can still watch it or like it. But this is primarily for people who get what I'm saying and for whom it means something. And in that way, I think that very few people have something they feel included in. I can say things that my audience will laugh at. But if I say the same things in a normal comedy club, they won't laugh. I remember that on your, I think it was on the Secret Dinosaur Call that you talk about it. And I think on an interview as well, you talk about like this time that you hooked up with an attractive guy. And <laughs> then he suddenly got intimidated because he was trying to come up with something oh, yeah. funny to say. Yeah, <laughs> He was already, um, I mean, I believe people when they tell me things. I just automatically, I, I automatically just believe people. Why would people lie? But then when I look in retrospect, I'm like, oh, <laughs> like, he did the classic thing that most conventionally attractive men will do, where he was like, from the beginning, he was like, I am moving to Finland on Saturday. And I was like, okay. So he was like making sure that I wouldn't get back in touch. You know, that was his way of saying, you know, don't fall in love with me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wait, all right, mate, I'll try. And he, he was like carrying a book. And I was like, oh, my God, he reads. But, you know, again, in retrospect, he was carrying a book because he wanted to impress people. And he was a, he said he was a poet and he was uh, he said he was a chef. I mean, I don't know. Anyways, but yeah, I remember I just wanted to get laid. That was all I wanted. And he was so hot. And I was just like. Sure. It feels like for him, it was such a big thing. I think it was a big thing that I was fat because he made a lot of effort to make sure that I understood that this was it. Like, <laughs> like you know, we're not going to tell him. We're not going to be public about this. I'm moving to Finland, <laughs> whatever. But then suddenly I was, we were like both naked and he started being like really nervous and it's very weird seeing a conventionally attractive white man who has like the most power in the whole world get nervous. And he started telling this bad joke. I couldn't really understand what was happening. And he was just like, oh, you're a comedian. So I thought, oh, I do. <laughs> 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 and the thing is, like, I'm in like sex situations. In many situations, I can get quite uh, so insecure. I can get quite anxious or, you know, but comedy is like the one I got that. Like that is the one thing. So I think I went from being quite meek and quite like, oh, I guess I'm naked in front of you to just being like, um, bitch, listen. I was just like, oh, don't tell me jokes. Like, I got this. I said something like, you wouldn't serve frozen pizza to a chef. And I don't think that kind of confidence is, uh, was really what he wanted. <laughs> but I had it again with my ex-boyfriend that I was with for three weeks, but was still technically my ex-boyfriend. He wanted to do comedy. And I think he said it as like a nice kind of a way to speak to me. And I just turned into like a psychopath. And I was like, you want to do comedy? Right. How are you going to do it? What's your five-year plan? Have you written jokes today? Are you going to gig tonight? And he was just like, um... I, I just I just like doing comedy. And I was like, well, you don't like doing comedy. Are you going to do comedy or are you not going to do comedy? It's not my most attractive trait, I think, to a lot of people. <laughs> oh, but it's so cool. It's so telling that it's like, oh, you do comedy. It's like your hobby. Anyone could do comedy, right? Yeah. Like, oh yeah, I can be funny too. Oh, it's the worst thing. I hate it so much. I remember the first time one of my friends saw me perform and I'd been going for three years and I'd been gigging five times, three to five times a week. Like I'd been to comedy shows more or less every Every day for three years, I'd watched comedy shows, I'd read all the books, I'd written so many jokes. And then he saw me perform and he was like, oh, you make me feel like I could do that. And I was like, are you fucking kidding me? 
<laughs> and then what did you say? Like, uh... I, I think I was just, I mean, it's, I often, I'll get like strange, like men I don't know come out to me after shows and be like, you should do this thing or I'm going to give you a joke to do. And you're just, in terms of existing as a, someone who's being seen as a woman in this world, I don't really mind all the abuse. Like I get a lot of abuse on the internet and that's all like, whatever. What always gets to me is the assumption that I'm unintelligent. That's the one thing you can't change that. It doesn't matter what you say. They will always talk to you as if they know better. I often have reviews of my comedy shows where there will be things in my show that they will write about as if it was a coincidence. Where I'm like, no, no, I planned that. This was all on purpose because I know what I'm doing and I'm a professional. I've been doing this for nine years. And in the reviews, they'll be like, actually... I just thought that this might be the theme. I'm like, yeah, of course it's the fucking theme. Like, that's what I put in there. (laughs) God, yeah. I totally hear you. I am a porn performer and I get that all the time as well. Like, I get to do films, present them in festivals, and then there's always, like, someone with raising their hand. Ah, so you, is this your hobby? It's like, oh like literally asking, is this your hobby? Oh, my it's God. Like, yeah, my, my friend Sapphire Blue, I don't know if you know her, she does porn in the UK, and she was like, all men who approach me, they approach me because they think I'm a little girl who needs help. When I'm a businesswoman, I run a business like this is a full-time job and so she's like the people who want a businesswoman wouldn't think that she was that because she does porn and she's like how do you not understand how much work goes into this like how many fucking photos I have to take to promote myself I see a lot of similarities I think if you're a good comedian you make it look like it's easy you make it look like you've just like wandered in off the street and you're like oh hey I'm just gonna say this thing right I don't know do you think it's the same in porn like you make it look like you're just like chilling out having a great time. Yes, it does. I mean, it also involves like this part of making yourself so vulnerable in front of a camera. And that's just something that it's difficult, that it's not just like for everyone. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I bet this, if it's the same as comedy, there'll be a lot of techniques, like practical things you need to know about. Like in comedy, there's like rules about people are people in Denmark are often angry that I perform in English in Denmark they're like why don't you just do it in Danish I'm like because a joke is so technical you know there has to be a certain rhythm a certain word a certain order of the word it's so technical that I can't just translate it because then it becomes a new language and then I have to rewrite the whole thing and rehearse it 500 times and I imagine that all of those little things people don't see and I imagine is that the same in porn are there little like technical things you need to know to do it there are like some kinds of porn that choreography is specific so there are like some shoots in when they say okay we need five minutes of blowjob 10 minutes of doggy style and then you have to deliver that but at the same time it has to be in a way in which like okay now switched into i don't know doggy whatever and then you're like ah 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 ah, of course you cannot so that's for example one way but there are like other forms also especially if we're talking about porn that it's like normally labeled as amateur in which people like go for it because a little bit less into their choreography and a little bit more into like the realistic quote unquote and that's even more tricky because you need to deliver that but in a way that is natural like there's the whole technique behind but it's also like the natural way of delivering it and with porn what happens is that people get sometimes like really obsessed about like the realistic element of it so they're like oh but you are of the good ones because your orgasms are real it's like Uh, how do you know? Uh, Yeah, thank you, you know? I mean, women in general, like people who aren't men, people will just look at and be like, hmm, you know, like the amount of times I've been in a dressing room and I've been like on a show and then a comedian leaves because he's just done his bit and then they will say goodbye to me because they assume I'm the girlfriend. I'm like, no, I'm actually the perform, you know, and that happens to so many female comedians where they just assume you're like anything but the comedian. And I think it's the same with women in all industries. I've heard of CEOs who were asked to go get coffee for like, <laughs> you know, the assistant of something. I think it's just like you see a woman or who you think is a woman and then you just assume that they don't know anything or they don't know what they're doing or they're just like have fallen into this by accident or I think that's the hardest thing to kind of fight because that's so biased in people's minds. They don't even know they're doing it. You can't say it to them. You can't talk to them because they don't know they have it. So they're just like 
And when you do talk to them about it, they're like, no, but she probably doesn't know what she's talking about. Why is she saying this? She's probably, she's not really sure what this, you know. I think that's the hardest part of like that side of not being a woman or seen as a woman or being treated lesser when they assume you don't know what you're doing. We work twice as hard as them. We have to work twice as hard as them to get half of the way that they are. Tell us about your upcoming book. It comes out in the UK on May the 2nd. And then I think it comes out in Denmark and Sweden in January 2020. But I think you can order it from Amazon or over the world. It's my first book about essentially why it's okay to be fat. So it talks about my lived experience with fatness. It talks about I have advice, like if you want to love your body, this is what I would recommend you to do. I think in general, what we hear about body positivity, it's all very, well, positive. I did a, a panel with some body positivity people and I had to interview them about body positivity. And there was like a huge audience full of women. And I said, how did you learn to love yourself? And they both kind of turned their bodies towards the audience and they said, just like love yourself, like you are amazing and you are beautiful. And I was like, yeah. And the people were whooping and cheering. And I was like, yeah, yeah, it's amazing. How? And they were like, yeah, you know, you are just, I mean, I woke up one morning and I looked in the mirror and I was like, I am amazing. And I was like, yeah, that's great. But how? Like people sitting, being like humans, struggling, you know, having been taught their entire lives that they're wrong. How? What do they actually do? And they'd still be like, just love yourself, like find that within you. And I'm like, you know, I want practical stuff. You know, I want actual Like, do this thing. One of the pieces of advice I have is like, um, go through your Instagram feed, remove everything that makes you feel bad, like makes you feel jealous or anxious or like you're not living up to a certain standard. And then put fat people in your Instagram feed. Follow fat people. Make sure you see fat people all the time so that it becomes normalized. Things that you can actually do in your life that doesn't require you to suddenly just start thinking you're amazing. So there's a lot of the book is about that. A lot of the book is also about the fact that this isn't our problem. You know, like there are perpetrators, you know, there are actual people and corporations who decide to create a society where everyone, especially women, just hate themselves and will spend so much money on trying to become thin. And then somehow the solution to that is that we then have to fix each other and ourselves. What's actually happening is people hating their bodies and people thinking they have to be thin to be happy is killing people. You know, like it's making people stressed. It's making people anxious. It's giving people cardiovascular disease, not fatness, but the way that we're treated because of fatness gives us cancer. Like there's all these studies made of like marginalized people and how much sicker they get because of the stress. There's a study where they had, I think, Latinx Americans have a 20 minute chat with people they knew were racist or something like that. And they measured like their cortisol levels and their general like physical well-being And they could see how much it affected them, not just speaking to them. That was bad, but also before, like when they knew they were about to meet a racist, like their bodies became anxious. And that's what it does to us, knowing that we're oppressed and knowing that we're being attacked at all times and we have to hate ourselves. So this is something that's like physically affecting a lot of people. So body positivity, I mean, yeah, I mean, I do have a chapter about it. So of course I want people to love themselves. That would be amazing. But that's not what this is. You know, that's not what this should be about. And the fact that we think that the whole fight is about us loving ourselves, it's just another way for them to win. Because no, that's not what this is about you. It's about what you've done to us. That's what we need to fight. Exactly. It's not entirely up to you to solve this. It's like a problem that it's put on your shoulders to solve. And it's like, hey, like the actual solution is for you not to be a jerk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so interesting that it's also like taking this with this sort of like political seriousness because in so many ways even like somehow like an indirect pact into self-love or coming to terms with any self-loathing or coming to terms with neutrality it's it can be found in the political side of things not only on what happens to you individually mental health whatever state it is this is not only about you so of course our feelings of self-love our feelings about our bodies is also interconnected with the way we view the world and the way the world has treated us and the, the way that the world treats other people in other bodies. And it's so elaborate. Like when you start looking into it, you start to feel like you're a conspiracy theorist because you're just like, oh my God, oh my God, <laughs> these people are all making money off of this. And you start hearing it in every single conversation, you know, like I was asked for ID when I bought alcohol and I was like, what? I'm 30. And the person said, oh, you just looked younger. 
And I said, oh, thank you. And I just went into this spiral. I was like, why did you say thank you? You don't think it's bad to be older. Why did you say thank you? You, you don't want to look 17. You don't, really don't want to look 17. <laughs> but that's just so in my brain that even though I know logically that I don't give a shit about age, I still said thank you. Oh, and then you go into like the whole, how ageism is also a way of you know, oppressing, especially women. And, you know, that's ableist in itself, because why do we don't, why do we not want to look old? Is that because we then become more unable to do something? In which case that's a capitalist thing, because then we can't work anymore. So we have no value to society. And ah, and you're just like, oh my God, it's everywhere. And it's, you know, it's so ingrained in our culture that you can be like the most prominent fat activist and someone can still be like, have you lost weight? And your first instinct would be to be like, oh, and you're like, no, no, no. Where did I come from? Fuck that. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I guess we all have like plenty of unlearning, but still it's just really important to have that in mind that things just need to change that. I think you said that before that you're just like tired of debating. Like there's just no point in which you can like, oh, but this, this, no, that's not the way things are. Like this needs to stop. I find it so, I was just asked to do an interview, quite like a high profile interview in the UK. And their like suggestion was that I had to just meet a lot of people who disagreed with me. And I was just like, no, because this isn't about agreeing. It's not an opinion. What I'm saying, and I know how this sounds, by the way, what I'm saying isn't an opinion. I don't have an opinion. I'm right. Like I am 100%. I don't, there's nothing that anyone can say to disagree. If they disagree, they're just uninformed and uneducated. I am right. Like this kills people. This is wrong. This needs to change. And if you don't agree, then you're just, then you're wrong. <laughs> but I don't think anyone really uh, likes that I say that. <laughs> I had a journalist say to me, it's just, you talk as if you're right. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> I am right. I am right about this. I don't want to entertain the illusion that a debate is worth having because what are we debating? My humanity? My right to live? My right to not be abused? Are we debating that? Because I don't think we should actually. Speaking of platforms and meaningful conversation, to have our audience acquainted, could you please tell us a little bit about your podcasts? How about like Made of Human? What is it about? Made of Human, I started about two, three years ago because I had just learned the word introvert and I felt like I suddenly understood so much about my life, like why I felt like a weirdo all, time, all the time. So I wanted to speak to people that I liked about how they function. How are you a human? Because this whole world is terrifying and so much stuff happens all the time. And how do you become an adult? And how do you deal with emotions? And how do you deal with oppression? And how, how are you a human? And I genuinely thought I would sit down with people and get answers, actual practical advice. People saying, oh, you just do this. But what I learned from speaking to all of these amazing people is that no one has any fucking idea. <laughs> like No one knows. No one knows how to do life. We're all just winging it and trying to figure it out one day at a time. And now I'm up to 135 episodes with a lot of people talking about, yeah, life. And it's become more, a bit more about activism, a bit more about representing. And there's very few white straight men on and the ones that are on are good or really mm -hmm. famous. And it's just my favorite thing. It's an hour of chat with people who are usually really, really nice and interesting and good people. Yeah, I heard that. I love your episode with Travis Alabanza. <gasps> Travis is amazing. Yeah. That was one of the rare live episodes I did. And Travis got, what, like 40 applause breaks throughout the whole thing. I just had to sit there in silence and wait for them to stop applauding. And I was like, this is amazing. They're incredible. Yeah, incredible. And also this one with Alison Bechtel. I was like browsing oh my God. through the... I was like, what? I know. Oh my God, Alison Bechtel. And we were in this tiny, tiny studio that was a thousand degrees and we were both sweating through our clothes. And Alison had just landed, so she was jet lagged and tired. And it was a bit of a mess of an interview, but I was just like, oh my God, <laughs> it's Alison Bechtel. <laughs> oh yeah, I love that one too. You always have that final question that you ask your guests. Tell me the story. We'll usually say at the end of the episode is you're in the delivery room and you have just been born, but you are also in the delivery room and you're holding yourself as a baby. And tiny little you is terrified because there's lights and sounds everywhere that, that wasn't there in the womb. And the, the little baby is scared because like, is this life? Is life going to be like this? Is life going to be full of lights and sounds at all times? Because that would be terrifying. So you can say something to yourself to calm yourself down. 
And then I say, what would you say to teeny tiny baby you? And what I think is so interesting is that I try to make it clear that people can't change the future. So you can't tell the baby, you know, do this, do that, because that won't nothing will change. That doesn't work. The idea of it is always, you know, what will you say about your life till this point to a tiny person who is scared of what will happen? And even though I make that so clear, most people will give advice. I mean, they will look me in the eyes and they'll just go, well, I would say be nicer to your mom. And I'm like, that is so interesting that people kind of refuse to, I think people are so desperate to, you know, I don't know, if people, maybe people live a lot in the past and people refuse to accept that the life has been the way it has been. Or I don't know why people do it, but it's almost every single time where actually what I like is for people to say, it'll be good or It'll be really bad. You're right to cry. Or I mean, there's so many amazing answers. Avery Edison gave one of my favorite answers. I don't really remember it, but it was something like, yeah, you know what? It will be really fucking shit. It'll be fucking horrendous, but sometimes it'll be really nice. And then that'll make it all worth it. It was something like that. I'm butchering it because she said it much better. But I now have this extra bit on Patreon, just for people who support on Patreon where I asked uh, the guests, what would you most want for people to know about you? And it's this mind fuck where basically every time you meet a new person, that person will instinctively just know this one thing about you. They'll just pop into their head so you don't have to ever say it or show them. What would that be? And I love that, how many people are like, oh, and you kind of realize what's really important to people and how people often feel misunderstood. And, you know, how many people sometimes say, I'm nice and I really wish people knew that. And you're like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. You think that when people meet you, they hate you. Like, this is awful. (laughs) Yeah, I'm quite into the questions like that that put people in this weird situation. But then you end up getting a lot of real stuff out of it. Well, that's. Pretty much a real question to begin with. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of, I mean, I like it. I really enjoy it. And it always kind of takes people back a bit. Has someone asked you that question to you? Yeah, and I always dodge it. <laughs> I feel like, well, because I don't actually know yet, but I think I'm currently in such intense therapy. And I kind of feel like at the end of, oh, not at the end of therapy, is there ever an end to therapy? I think I will have an answer one day. And I think it'll, it'll make sense to me one day. But right now I would just be like... I know you are. I think I need some time. I think (laughs) give me a year. Give me a year and I'll see. So tell me about the secret dinosaur cult. Secret dinosaur cult is so, well, basically, so Jody Mitchell, who is, was also a guest on Made of Human, is this incredible drag king and comedian. I mean, just the funniest, funniest person. And we have so many things in common, weirdly. When we first met, I don't think we knew how much we had in common. Jody had three dads who all left and I have one dad who left twice. So we both have like massive daddy issues. And throughout the, so see what call it's like a live comedy podcast about trauma and daddy issues and dinosaurs, a bit about dinosaurs as well. And we kind of talk about just like topics. We'll talk about anything from like ghosts to periods to gender, being non-binary, sex, kink, fat. like try to just talk about basically everything, but from our perspective and we try to make it funny. And throughout the podcast, I think Jody came out as non-binary in the beginning. And then I came out as non-binary a few months ago. And it was just, which I haven't really done other places than in podcasts. Just because I don't know. I don't know yet. I don't know how to talk about it yet. But Secret Dinosaur Cult felt like the place to do it because we're both these two kind of queer, just people. And we can do it through jokes and we can do it through this incredible audience we have who are just like, we've gotten like packages and parcels from like Australia. We, we have fans in South Africa. Like this reaches people all over the world, which is amazing. And it's so funny. Like it's just so funny. Jody is so, so funny. And it's very rare that you can find someone in comedy that you just click with like that. Like you have this mutual respect and you can just talk for hours and it'll still be funny and interesting. And no one talks over each other. No one's like undermining each other. A lot of people, when they compliment the podcast, they start by saying, I was put off listening for a while because of the weird title. <laughs> I think yeah, that's, I think with dinosaurs, so you, what we do with the dinosaurs is we will pick a dinosaur that then presents the theme. It's always a bit of a, a weird mess or something like they found a skeleton of a T-Rex somewhere. I forget facts all the time. They forgot they found a skeleton of a T-Rex. They said it was a man, I think, a boy dinosaur. And then it turned out it probably wasn't. So they ended up saying, you know what, this is just a gender neutral dinosaur. It's a non-binary dinosaur. It then got a Twitter account that was like Sue the T-Rex. Was like, so we presented the whole story about the skeleton and the fossils. And then we were like, and the topic is gender. So we'll do these 
you know, the Nanoxaurus, which was um, like a t- tiny T-Rex looking dinosaur that existed on the North, what is now the North Pole. And I used that to present Christmas, you know, so it has nothing really with the topic. What are your coming plans work-wise and where can people find your work and support it? The most useful thing is my newsletter. I don't send it out too often. I think it's like once a month or so, which you can sign up for on sophiehagen.com. So F-I-E-H-H-E-E-N.com. And that's where everything will always be announced and you won't miss anything if you just sign up for that. I'm going on tour of the UK this month now, April, May, June, doing a new show called The Bum Swing. I have the book coming out, Happy Fat. I am also going on tour <laughs> this autumn, I think, with The Bum Swing, the new show. So much stuff. Yeah, all in all, Twitter. Instagram, Facebook, I'm Sophie Hagen and all of them. Apart from Instagram, I'm Sophie Hagen DK, which stands for Denmark, not Dick. I'm everywhere. I do a lot of stuff. I have two shows I've filmed that you can buy on sophiehagen.com forward slash shop, which are five pounds each. And those are my two trauma shows, Shimmer Shatter and Death Baby Frog, about being an introvert and about emotional abuse. I have both secret dinosaur called and Mopod have Patreons. That's Patreon and then it's slash Mopod, M-O-H-P-O-D, or forward slash secret dinosaur cult where you can support. Well, Sophie, thank you so much for your time and for the lovely chat. And thank, you for good- and thank you for making an amazing podcast. I really, really love it. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we'll be looking forward to keeping up with your work and best luck with your tour. And we'll be waiting for Happy Fat next month. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Erstis Podcast Meets. If you enjoyed these episodes, there will be more of this coming to keep you going in between our regular episodes. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast wherever you like to listen. New episodes come out on the first Friday of every month. Follow us on Twitter at Erstis Podcast and you won't miss a thing. The Erstis Podcast.